brazen bank robberies in broad daylight. The idea was to train them as soldiers, how to shoot and how to rob banks. Strategic and indiscriminate bombings. We had no idea, though, that when my dad went to work that day, he was going to be murdered. Senseless assassinations of random police officers. They don't just shoot them. They then stand over them and just continue to shoot into their bodies, into their heads. It was just unspeakably violent. The Black Liberation Army unleashed a reign of terror on New York City. There was no real organized leadership. These were smaller little splinter organizations that essentially operated autonomously, not unlike the terror cells that we see today. And Asada Shakur, their heart and soul, remains one of the most wanted fugitives in the world. The FBI now considers her a domestic terrorist. When will this convicted killer be brought to justice? Werner Forrest was executed with his own gun. She was actively involved in that, actively involved in that murder and should be held responsible for it. Michelle Malkin investigates. Now, here's Michelle Malkin. If you've ever had any doubts about how the weak-willed Obama administration managed its foreign policy and dealings with terrorists, both here and abroad, look no further than the case of Joanne Chesimard, AKA Asada Shakur. She's a familiar name in pop culture. Asada is the godmother and step-aunt of slain rap star Tupac Shakur. But underneath the celebrity whitewash, lies a blood-stained legacy. Asada rose to power during the turbulent 1970s as a member and de facto leader of one of the most violent revolutionary groups in US history, the Black Liberation Army. A convicted cop killer, Shakur escaped from prison in 1979 and has spent nearly 40 years in political exile in Cuba with the blessing of the late Fidel Castro himself. While the Castro regime has continued to step up its repression of the Cuban people under the direction of Fidel's younger brother, Raul, the Obama administration looked the other way, offering concession after concession. On July 16, 2015, Obama restored diplomatic relations with the communist island nation, much to the chagrin of Cuban-American exiles and their families, including Senators Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. One of the primary reasons why they opposed the president's proclamation, what, if anything, had been done to secure the return of U.S. fugitives harbored in Cuba. Now, with Donald Trump in the driver's seat and Fidel Castro rotting in hell, America has a chance to right a four-decade-old wrong. This is the story of a fugitive left-wing radical, the godmother of the cop-hating Black Lives Matter movement, flying free as a bird, glorified by Hollywood and academia a slap in the face to every law enforcement officer in America. New York City is no stranger to despicable acts of violence. And in the 1970s, the city was home base to some of the most radical and barbaric revolutionary gangs this country has ever witnessed. Brian Burrow is the author of Days of Rage, a definitive history about fringe fanatical groups that terrorized America in the 70s and 80s. While this violence went on around the country, and there were probably seven or eight active underground groups, New York was the ep epicenter. It was always the epicenter. The most visible of these radical groups included the Weathermen Underground, the Symbionese Liberation Army, the FALN, and the worst defender of all, the Black Liberation Army. We talk so often about the radicalization of the 60s, the great mass demonstrations and protests. And what I think much of America has lost sight of is the underground violence that spun off from those groups during the 1970s. You had the Black Panthers, which spun off a group called the Black Liberation Army, whose sole uh, goal was assassinating policemen. James Gannon is a retired investigator with the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force based in Newark, New Jersey. The Black Liberation Army at that time was targeting police officers. 
you know, there's grenade attacks on police officers, shootings of police officers, you know, and uh, it was a really rugged time for the police in the 70s, you know. I come from a family uh, of police. My father was a highly decorated New York City police detective. And I remember as a kid going to those funerals at the time. It was a difficult time and uh, sort of similar to what seems to be going on right now in the United States with many police officers also being murdered. Joe Connor is an author and anti-terror advocate. His father was the victim of a bombing by the FALN, a Puerto Rican terrorist organization aligned with the BLA. The FALN, the BLA, they all claimed that they were trying to liberate people, but they clearly weren't. They had Marxist tendencies. They were looking to subjugate people beneath them. They weren't looking to free people. They were looking to murder people. They were looking to cause mayhem. The problem when you look at all these radical groups of the 70s, the underground groups, is to say, what were they trying to achieve with this violence? Did they really think they could overthrow the government? That's crazy. Um, and what on earth did they think they were trying to achieve by assassinating policemen? Part of it was they believed by initiating violence they would get support from the urban ghettos, where along with poverty, along with job loss, one of the great pressing issues was police brutality. And, you know, on this, you, they were absolutely right. You think uh, American police can be tough these days. Back in the 60s and 70s, if you were a young black man picked up in New York, you were routinely beaten. Professor Angela James teaches Pan-African Studies at Cal State University, Los Angeles. One of the pivotal contributions of the Black Panther Party was their unapologetic blackness, their joyful, gleeful, unapologetic blackness, and their refusal to be cowed by the state repression. And they decided that the best course of action to stop police brutality at that time was to take advantage of this gun crazy culture's openness towards guns. And in fact, here in California, that the restriction against that was created specifically to repress their ability to look in the face of those oppressive police occupying armies within their communities and say, no, no, we do not submit to this. The Black Liberation Army was a splinter group comprised of the most radical members of the Black Panther Party. It's funny, in, in recent years, looking at the hip hop scene, there's always been this rivalry between the East Coast and the West Coast. It was exactly the same uh, in the Black Panthers in the early 1970s. The West Coast Panthers were identified with Huey Newton, who was the titular leader of the Panthers, and the New York Panthers, who were by far the most militant large chapter of the Panthers were aligned with Eldridge Cleaver, who was calling for an underground war to overthrow the government, or at least to kill uh, policemen. And several smaller chapters that wanted a military war against the United States spun off from the Panther Party itself and began to form cells of armed people uh, that called themselves the Black Liberation Army, the BLA. Carol Swain is a professor of political science and law at Vanderbilt University. The Black Liberation uh, Army was much more uh, violent in the sense that it wanted to have a revolution that would overthrow America as we know it. And so they were dedicated to principles of being, you know, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, anti-sexist, uh, the, the typical Marxist uh, planks. The BLA sleeper cells, not unlike the purported Islamic terrorism cells of today, operated completely independently from each other. When there's independent cells, a lot of uh, members of the cells don't know what the other members are doing, right? So that makes, that makes them uh, have a little bit of advantage there. Even if people want to cooperate, there's only a certain amount of information that they do know. With opaque marching orders from their leader, Eldridge Cleaver, small units were allegedly dispatched to commit a string of robberies, taking down drug dealers and banks. 
the idea being that if one of them was taken out, one leadership faction was taken out, the others would, would, not, would not necessarily topple, would not necessarily be arrested. The BLA was made up entirely of men, with the exception of one member, 23-year-old Joanne Chesimard, yet another disillusioned Black Panther Party associate who would come to be known as Asada Shakur. Joanne Chesimard also refers to herself as Asata Shakur, was identified in the Black Liberation Army. People called her like the mother hen. She had a lot to say of what went on there. For those of you who do not know anything about me, um, my name is Asada Shakur. Um, I was and still am a political activist. Initially, in those first months of 1971, when the BLA began shooting and killing New York policemen, her reputation, uh, at least at the safe house where she was based in the Bronx, was as the medic. She apparently, along the way, had, uh, had learned first aid, and on several occasions when BLA soldiers uh, were shot, uh, they came back to this safe house. Um, she was the one tasked with bandaging them up. She was totally uh, committed to her cause which she saw as black liberation. She saw America as a very racist, oppressive society. And what we can see is that they are the real uh, forerunner of what is calling itself today as the Black Lives Matter movement. There was little doubt that Asada Shakur knew exactly what the Black Liberation Army was about when she joined them in 1970. According to Vanity Fair special correspondent and author of Days of Rage, Brian Burrow, multiple sources confirm that the BLA's directives were to assassinate police officers and rob banks, the only way they could raise money to finance their terrorist activities. The people that tended to join the BLA were those who had long-standing personal and institutional grievances against cops. Many of them had been in prison. Many of them were gangbangers. Shakur was nothing like that, intelligent, passionate and college educated. She had mainly participated in campus protests and sit-ins. It seems almost impossible to fathom, but Shakur went from a young, impressionable kid with a bright future to a member of one of the most notorious revolutionary groups in the country where murder and mayhem were commonplace. You can talk Marxism and socialism all you want, but the people in the BLA wanted vengeance against the police, and Shakur, it is believed, played a large role in that effort. By 1972, Asada was officially in control of her own cell. But by now, many of Shakur's BLA cohorts were becoming increasingly more violent, attracting the attention of the FBI, who were working closely with the NYPD. Asada Shakur and her crew, they're identified as a domestic extremism group uh, in the United States. And therefore, the FBI was involved. When you talk to veterans of the radical left, they will justify a certain amount of the violence as a reaction to a program that the FBI had initiated under J. Edgar Hoover called COINTELPRO, which was essentially designed um, to sow dissent among the groups. COINTELPRO, I think, uh, is widely uh, believed today to have been, um, you know, an effort that went over the line. Uh, did that justify the violence of the 1970s that these groups perpetuated? Did it justify assassinating police? I think that's, uh, uh, that's debatable. As the membership of the BLA dwindled, the result of deadly gun battles with the police, the group spun out of control. They carry out what is one of the most vicious uh, attacks in the history of NYPD. Three BLA soldiers um, ambush and kill uh, two NYPD officers, a black officer and a white officer, on the streets of the East Village at the end of January 1972. And they don't just shoot them, they then stand over them and just continue to shoot into their bodies, into their heads. It was just unspeakably violent. Asada was never uh, uh, directly linked to that attack. Nobody believes that she pulled a trigger, but she was part of that group that did it. A nationwide manhunt was underway. But that didn't stop Shakur and her crew from continuing to target unsuspecting police officers. You can say with confidence that she was a leader of the last BLA cell in New York and that was systematically out hunting cops 
and managed to ambush uh, several different groups. In response, the NYPD and the FBI redoubled their efforts and began picking off Assad's men, her soldiers, one by one, all during early 1973 in a, a series of bloody shootouts. Coming up, the FBI's most wanted woman and the million dollar bounty. But she was elevated in the media to a, a cult, almost a cult figure. She's like a cause celebrité for a huge part of the left here. And it makes me wonder if they actually know what kind of criminal, what kind of murderer, what kind of terrorist Sada Shakur is. This is not a soccer mom. This is a woman who was involved in very high-end, very violent crimes. The police community, whether it be the New Jersey State Police or the FBI, only wants to see that justice is served. Next, Shakur snaps. Her death squad's in a downward spiral, and she's branded the most dangerous woman in America when we come back. I believe that technology and innovation are the most powerful ways to communicate in today's world. It's always been difficult to find the facts, harder to uncover truth, cut through the bias and stay informed. Most difficult of all, holding the mainstream media accountable for spin and bias. For me, that is what CRTV changed. CRTV is part of a platform for those looking for a voice outside the mainstream questioning the official story, asking what others are unwilling to ask, providing content that uplifts individuals and empowers people with information to take control of their own lives, telling stories that have never been told. CRTV is about educating, about empowering. Join the media revolution at CRTV.com. By 1973, Asada Shakur had become the stuff of legend. She was the subject of a multi-state manhunt. The FBI labeled her the revolutionary mother hen of a Black Liberation Army cell that had conducted a series of cold-blooded murders of New York City police officers, including the execution-style killings of Joseph Piagentini and Waverly Jones on May 21st, 1971, and Gregory Foster and Rocco Lurie on January 28th, 1972. The cops branded her the final wanted fugitive of the gang, the soul of the BLA who kept them together, kept them moving, and kept them shooting. Her picture was plastered in police precincts and banks across New York City as a shoot-to-kill target. The feds and the NYPD were closing in. With no place left to hide, Asada and the remaining members of her cell were out of options. A decision was made. It was time to flee the city. And now, part two of our investigation. On November 20th, 2016, San Antonio Detective Benjamin Marconi was killed in an ambush, the first of four officers shot during a seemingly unconnected multi-state crime spree. The killing was strikingly similar to the execution-style Dallas and Baton Rouge shootings, allegedly influenced by the rhetoric of the Black Lives Matter movement and the murders of police officers inspired by the Black Liberation Army's tactics 40 years earlier. A petition to formally label Black Lives Matter a domestic terror group was unilaterally shut down by one President Barack Obama. That was not the case during the killing spree that targeted police officers in the 1970s. A federally sponsored joint terrorism task force made up of local law enforcement agencies and the FBI were on a mission. Track down and take down designated domestic terrorist Asada Shakur at any cost. Brian Burrow authored the book Days of Rage and conducted in-depth interviews with surviving members of the Black Liberation Army. By May of 1973, the pressure that the NYPD and to some extent the FBI were putting on the remaining few members of the BLA was intense. You know, a number of them had been captured, a number of them had been killed. And one night in May 1973, Asada and her partner at the time, kind of the intellectual brains of, of the BLA, Zaid Shakur, uh, decided to, that, that New York had gotten too hot. And so they drove out, uh, driven by a young man named Clark Squire. Uh, they drove out the Lincoln Tunnel. They stopped at a rest area around midnight. And about 45 minutes later, they were heading south on the New Jersey Turnpike. Where they were headed, we really don't know. 
James Gannon is a retired deputy chief of investigations at the Morris County, New Jersey Prosecutor's Office. For two years, he was assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force and worked the Asada Shakur case. They were stopped on the New Jersey Turnpike, southbound in East Brunswick. 12.45 a.m., inoperable tail light lens. Trooper James Harper was engaged with uh, some of the occupants of the vehicle, was backed up by Warner Forrester. Walked up to the side, uh, asked the driver, Mr. Squire, to get out, called for backup, another officer. Uh, pulled up and was uh, began to question those inside. Uh, Asada was sitting in the shotgun uh, seat, and he saw her put her arm, her hand, underneath her body as if to go for a gun. In, in, in fact, this is what she was doing. Uh, the officer opened fire. Uh, in the exchange of gunfire that happened, uh, Zay Chakur sitting in the back was shot and killed, uh, as was one of the two troopers, the one behind the car, named Warner Forster. Carol Swain is a professor of law at Vanderbilt University and has a working knowledge of Asada Shakur's case history. She reportedly fired on the officers and uh, she was shot in that incident. And according to her version of it, she was outside the car, she had her hands up in a surrender position and she was shot three times, including one time in the back. Clark Squire got in the car, drove off. As it happened, this exchange was less than a mile from the state police headquarters. And the remaining trooper ran for it, put out an eight, you know, an all points bulletin. Uh, and, and every trooper in New Jersey suddenly was looking for Asada and Clark Squire. They ultimately found uh, the car just maybe five miles south on the turnpike. Uh, Clark Squire was spotted uh, running off into the woods uh, where he was later captured, and Asada was captured without event, sitting on the side of the highway, wounded. Asada was taken into custody and charged with two counts of murder because she allegedly fired the shots that killed both state trooper Werner Forster and her accomplice, Zayed Shakur. What followed baffled the law enforcement community. Asada became a glorified folk hero an icon to those in the black community who felt the police had mistreated them. Joe Connor is an anti-terror advocate. His father was killed in a brutal bombing attack by the FALN, a group allied with the Black Liberation Army. She was elevated in the media to a cult, almost a cult figure. She's like a cause celebrité for a huge part of the left here. And it makes me wonder if they actually know what kind of criminal, what kind of murderer, what kind of terrorist as Sada Shakur is. She was called the heart and soul of the BLA. She was called Mother Love. I mean, she became this symbol. Uh, if you were on the left, perhaps you revered her. If you were out in Des Moines or Denver or Dallas, you thought she was this crazy African-American woman uh, allied with a group trying to kill police. Um, but, but whatever you thought of her, she became an icon uh, for America in the 1970s. She was kind of seen as an African-American Bonnie of Bonnie and Clyde. Deneen Borelli is a senior political correspondent with Conservative Review. Personally, I think it's outrageous that there were individuals who felt that this woman should have been free, should have been let go. Uh, you, we are a country of rules and laws. The trial turned into a radicalized circus. With renowned far-lefty lawyer William Kunstler at the helm, the case became as much about race as it was about murder. But in the end, Kunstler's left-leaning tactics failed to sway the jury. In 1977, Asada was convicted on one murder charge and six assault charges, and sentenced to life plus 30 years for the crimes. Asanta Shakur was incarcerated at a women's prison facility in New Jersey. And because it wasn't a maximum security facility, they ended up moving her to a facility that was called the Yardville Youth Correctional Center. And my father worked at the Yardville Youth Correctional Center in Yardville, New Jersey. And he did tell me that he did see her there. And uh, she was actually in isolation because this was a male facility. That was a place where she was in uh, solitary confinement. 
1978, Shakur was transferred to Clinton Correctional Facility for Women in Western New Jersey. The amazing thing about the facility where Asada was being kept, the Clinton Correctional Facility for Women, is, is the security. The heavy security building where maybe eight women were kept was, you know, behind a single thing of barbed wire off in, in, in back of a parking lot. There was very little screening of who met her, so anybody could pretty much could come meet her. And so several members of the BLA did, including one of its last great leaders, a, a man named Sekou Odinga, who came and made clear in hushed tones that they were thinking about breaking her out, and would she be open to that? And she was like, oh yeah, I'd definitely be open to it. And so a plan began to be hatched to break her out of prison. On November 2nd, 1979, three armed men posing as visitors held up a corrections officer commandeered a prison van at gunpoint and escaped in cars waiting along the interstate. Well, the whole story of Asada Shakur's escape from a correctional uh, facility, I mean, it's the stuff of a movie. Uh, you know, you have these guys that are part of the Black Liberation Army going into a max maximum security prison, and somehow they're able to spring a prisoner. That has helped make her someone that would be glorified by uh, activists of the political left. This lady was convicted by her peers at trial. She broke out. There's a, you know, uh, an unlawful flight to avoid confinement warrant out for her, a UFAC warrant uh, out for her. Everybody in the uh, Warner Forest family, everybody in the New Jersey State Police wants to see her back to answer those charges. Obviously, there was a, a, a massive manhunt uh, for Asada and those who had broken her out. Uh, the NYPD and the FBI staged raids all around New York, and they never found her. Then, out of nowhere, two years later, she services in Cuba, uh, where Fidel Castro's government uh, uh, gives her sanctuary. How she actually got there has never been entirely clear. People who had been in the BLA that I spoke with suggested, in fact, that they'd gone through Bahama, the Bahamas and that she was picked up by, uh, uh, met by a Cuban patrol boat of some type and whisked over to, to Havana. It is no surprise that someone like Joanne Chesimard or Asata Shakur received safe haven in Cuba. That Charlie Hill, who murdered a cop in New Mexico, is now in Cuba. That William Morales, who built the bomb that murdered, was used to murder my father, that he is in Cuba. Cuba's the focal point of all, these, of all these groups. Cuba has long been a haven for African Americans who've committed what might be interpreted as political crimes. Black Panthers such as Eldridge Cleaver and Huey Newton both spent time there in the 1960s. There are as many as 70 American fugitives believed to be living on the island, sheltered under the guise of political asylum. Asada Shakur was welcomed with open arms by the Cuban government. As a political refugee, she was provided with an apartment, given stipends and ration books, and supported until she found work. She attended college, studying for a master's degree in social sciences, part of a program sponsored by the Cuban Communist Party. Shakur raised her American-born daughter in Cuba and in 1987 published an autobiography detailing her life without mentioning the Turnpike shootout. The elusive fugitive was rarely photographed in public. She lived openly and freely, continuing to maintain and promote her terrorist ideology. Shakur granted interviews and gave anti-U.S. government speeches, espousing the Black Liberation Army's message of revolution and terrorism. She started a website to promote her causes. But all that could change with the stroke of a pen. On May 2, 2013, the 40th anniversary of the murder of New Jersey State Trooper Werner Forster, the FBI placed Joanne Chesimard, a.k.a. Asada Shakur, on its top 10 most wanted terrorist list. Soon after the announcement, Shakur disappeared off the radar. She has to look over her shoulder, too, because that's what we want her to do, keep on looking over her shoulder. You know, she shouldn't have the liberties that everybody else has, okay? And she better keep on looking over her shoulder, because people will still be out there looking for her. Very interested, 
and that resources are dedicated to this case. Shakur became the first woman ever to make the roster. Rewards of $2 million, $1 million from the FBI, and $1 million from the state of New Jersey were offered for information leading to her capture and return. It's kind of amazing that there has never been more heat on Asada Shakur, pressure for the, for the capture of Asada Shakur, than at any time in the last 45 years since she was in her heyday on the streets of New York. I've talked with people who believe that she's living quietly somewhere in Cuba. Uh, I've talked to other who, uh, people who think that that's crazy. Uh, I mean, that she would be crazy uh, to have stayed in Cuba, that perhaps she slipped out to a, uh, a country that, that might, where people might help her, such as Venezuela. But the bottom line is right now, no one knows where she is. This is not a soccer mom. This is a woman who was involved in very high-end, very violent crimes. The police community, whether it be the New Jersey State Police or the FBI, the police community only wants to see that justice is served. With Obama's normalization of U.S.-Cuba relations came the possibility that America's most wanted fugitive might be brought to justice. But as usual with Obama, it was all carrots and no sticks. It's never been entirely clear how much pressure the Obama administration was placing on the Cuban government uh, to turn her over. Clearly, we've normalized relations uh, while still allowing the Cuban government to say that they would not turn her over um, because she was given official protection. Cuba was removed from the terror list by the Obama administration, by the state sponsor of terror list, while it is sponsoring terrorists. We've given in to Cuba. We're, we're pumping billions of dollars now in tourism money into a country. It's, it could be more than 10% of their economy will come from U.S. tourist dollars. We have to say, if we are going to open any further relations with Cuba, we need to get these terrorists returned. Dan O'Donnell is a syndicated conservative news and talk show radio host. With the Trump administration taking power, there's now significant hope in New Jersey that finally, finally, Asada Shakur will be brought to justice, that there will be a more hardline stance taken with Cuba, that if the nation wants to keep up its cozy diplomatic and trade relationship with the United States of America, that it's going to have to hold up its end of the bargain, that it's going to have to extradite Shakur as well as other criminals that have sought refuge and asylum in Cuba over the years. That's the thinking, anyway, that the Trump administration will take a much more firm hand than the Obama administration did with respect to the Castros and the Cuban regime. It's an investigation that's not getting dusty. It's an investigation that is assigned. Resources are assigned to it. It may sound a little funny to people in the business world, but that's a priority investigation for a lot of different reasons. Um, most heinous crime that can be committed is murder. Uh, there are also terrorist incidents connected to this, right here in the beautiful Garden State, so and in New York City. So that'll always get priority A. It will never stop. The heat will be on Joanne Chesmer till death do her part. While politicians on both sides of the aisle wrestle over how to deal with Cuba's reluctance to extradite our most wanted domestic terrorist, here in the United States, the blinded by the light Black Lives Matter movement has adopted Asada Shakur as their new mascot. Asada is being hailed as a hero for the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, they wear t-shirts that say, Asada taught me, and they chant some of her slogans. And so she's clearly having an enormous impact on that group. And when we think about uh, just some of the police killings that are taking place that have been loosely connected to the Black Lives Matter movement, and we think about Asada and her involvement with the Black Liberation Army, we see how one movement has influenced the other and why she just has enormous influence. Angela James is a professor of Pan-African Studies at Cal State University in Los Angeles. Asada Shakur is incredibly important um, inspiration to many of us who continue to forward the cause of black liberation, black freedom, it's her insights, 
in terms of history, uh, continue to guide our own approach to liberation, which includes not only kind of a concern with physical and material circumstance, but with our spirits. I have long found her a great inspiration in my own scholarship and work, and uh, she has emerged again as an incredible inspiration for young people who are concerned with the cause of black liberation. Asada is probably more popular as an icon in the, the, the left-wing black political movement than she has been at any time since, since her capture. You know, you see her, her name pop up on t-shirts at Black Lives Matters. You know, I think probably too much could be made of all this. Um, I think a lot of the young people who, are, uh, who, who want to sing her praises probably are not actually aware of all the, the crimes that she carried out. Um, uh, and there's others that probably just don't care. But she remains to this day an icon for many people out there who believe that the police are bad news and they need to be fought back against. The question is, what will become of Asada Shakur? To law enforcement, she's the killer convicted in the execution-style slaying of New Jersey State Trooper Werner Forster in 1973. She's the Black Liberation Army leader busted out of prison by her comrades two years into a life sentence. A domestic terrorist implicated in a string of crimes and a key part of an organization that waged war on police. To her supporters, Shakur has been persecuted by the same corrupt and racist justice system that they say persecuted Michael Brown and Eric Gardner. During the protests in Ferguson, Missouri, her name became a rallying cry. She has long been a revolutionary symbol, a radical black female often described as, quote, the ultimate fugitive from injustice. Her biggest problem? She seems to show absolutely no remorse and instead refers to herself as, quote, a 20th century escaped slave. And across the country, there are those who still insist on putting her on a pedestal, but voices of reason are fighting back. In 2013, Asada's alma mater, City University of New York, or CUNY, shuttered the Morales Shakur Students Community Center, built in honor of her and William Morales, leader of the FALN, the group that claimed responsibility for a string of deadly bombings in New York. I agree with critics who saw the community center as a symbol of campus political correctness gone berserk. Its unofficial name, a glorification of City College alumni who joined revolutionary organizations and went on the lam. The students protested, but in the end, common sense won out. NYPD officers and university security shut down the center. There is still much debate over who shot who first and what the evidence says or doesn't say. Shakur maintains that the officer was the aggressor, that she was shot while her hands were up and wounded in such a way that she could not have fired the execution-style shot that ended the trooper's life. But an officer was shot dead on the side of the road. Shakur was convicted. She fled justice. And this year, on the 40th anniversary of her conviction, she's free as a bird. President Trump can right this four decades old wrong and move to extradite her. I hope he seizes the moment. In today's Social Media Minute, I'm opening up my email bag. Among the many hats I wear is my syndicated newspaper columnist hat. I've been writing a weekly column for Creator Syndicate since 1999. Recently, the left-wing San Francisco Chronicle ran a few of my pieces, including one about Michelle Obama and the repeated story she told about being discriminated against at a Target store. It was a phony fable, fake news, but liberal readers didn't want to hear it. Reader John Carroll emailed, quote, your comment in my local newspaper today was so without merit and your hatefulness is so wildly inappropriate toward Michelle Obama, who has more class and quality in her pinky finger than you will ever have in your whole lifetime, ever. Your tone and content were as expected, small-minded and your racism barely concealed. Yours in contempt, John. Reader Stephen Hymoff hyperventilated. Michelle Obama is the most popular public figure in America and one of the most admired and beloved women in the world. You, on the other hand, are an angry, mean Tea Party loser who's built her career on insulting Democrats. I have written the San Francisco Chronicle and urged them not to publish your crap again. And reader Debbie in Berkeley wrote, Dear Ms. Malkin, 
Feeling a little jealous, perhaps, of the beautiful, gracious, and brilliant Michelle Obama? Or are you perhaps a racist nitpicker trying to find fault any way you can with Michelle Obama? Whatever your problem is, try to get over it, dear. You come off as being not only bitter and angry, but also as racist and someone who is just plain dumb. You've only embarrassed yourself with your opinion in the San Francisco Chronicle today. Many of us are just laughing at you tonight. A Michelle who comes off as being ugly, bitter, and stupid. The reviews weren't all bad, though. Reader Chip cheered, I was flabbergasted that my San Francisco liberal Obama-loving paper would even mention your name, let alone publish your wonderful article. I can't wait until the Chronicle publishes the letters to the editor in the next few days screaming at you and demanding they never publish another one of your articles. Please keep them coming. Thank you. I will indeed keep them coming. If you've got feedback for me, send it to michelle at michellemalkininvestigates.com. In our Crap Weasel Watch, we call out the political cheaters, government thieves, con artists, frauds, and all-around idiots making America, and in this case, the world, worse. Heads up, pro-life activists. Today's Crap Weasels are both speech-crushing abortion cheerleading houses of the French Parliament. In December 2016, both the French National Assembly and the Senate approved a bill banning anti-abortion websites. Translation, the social justice safe spacers don't want you exposed to websites that celebrate a culture of life. The horror. Freedom of expression should not be confused with manipulating minds, according to the French family minister. This could criminalize everything from informational websites to church teachings about abortion. If it can be labeled false, manipulative, or intimidating, the censors stand ready to put it on ice. Mon Dieu, something stinks, and it ain't Pepe Le Pew. To the crap weasel left on both sides of the pond, shut uppery is always the answer. God bless America, where the answer to speech we don't like is more speech, louder speech, bolder speech. Today, our Bulldog Award goes to Kimberly Corbin, proud mom, rape survivor, victim's advocate, and dedicated champion of your Second Amendment rights. Kimberly was a 20-year-old sophomore at the University of Northern Colorado when a stranger broke into her apartment and sexually assaulted her for two hours. Her assailant was sentenced to 24 years to life, and she began firearms training. Now, as Sheriff David Clark put it, this brave woman voluntarily shares the story of her horrific event so that other women do not have to experience what she did. In 2013, Kimberly fought the Bloomberg-funded anti-gunners in Colorado. Gun-grabbing Dems won't legislate this gun-toting gal into victimhood. In 2016, she confronted President Obama at a gun control town hall. Quote, I have been unspeakably victimized once already, and I refuse to let that happen again to myself or my kids, she said. His response? Patronizing, prevaricating propaganda, which only strengthened her resolve. Ten years after she was raped, Kimberly wrote, I am no longer a victim, but am instead a survivor. Amen, Kimberly. A bulldog survivor inspiring women, men, and children to fight like a girl and shoot like a girl. Next on Michelle Mulkin Investigates. As refugees continue to flood into Europe, so do their extreme Islamic values. We're talking about something that's inevitably going to lead to societal controversies, clashes, and strife, and maybe even civil war, because they're not going to give up their values, they're not going to assimilate, quite the contrary, they think their values are superior to ours. A cultural clash that includes gender subjugation, resulting in mass sexual assaults across the continent. This is why Muslim men who are coming to Western cultures, we have already seen how they attacked women on New Year's Eve, how they are attacking women all across Europe. In Germany, hundreds, if not thousands of women were sexually assaulted during a New Year's Eve celebration. Essentially, it's a practice in many Muslim countries where large groups of Muslim males surround individual women and begin to sexually assault them. Women are viewed as second-class citizens legally, and socially, and culturally. There's no place in Germany that is really safe for women today. That's really a consequence of this mass migration of mostly single males. So what is America doing? Repeating the mistakes of its European allies. 
We're trying to play whack-a-mole with this whole question of vetting. Do we have a proper vetting system in place for Syria, for Somalia, for Iraq? And obviously we don't have a proper vetting system. Most people do not realize that this type of behavior and this type of culture has been now imported into the United States. Because right now we have cases of sexual assault and rape in six states across the United States where refugees have been resettled. And we don't yet fully know the consequences. Stay tuned for the next edition of Michelle Malkin Investigates. If you've got a story to share, email me at michelle at michellemalkininvestigates.com. On this show, we dig deeper, shatter false narratives, and get answers in the pursuit of justice. On behalf of our entire team, I'm Michelle Malkin. Thanks so much for joining us.